All right, well, good evening and good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Moore. I'm the China Program Director uh, for Penn Global. I'm delighted to welcome you all to uh, this event in our China Faculty Speaker Series on a topic that, of course, could not be any more important, uh, the future of U.S.-China relations. I wanted to say a little bit about uh, the series uh, at the outset. It's co-sponsored uh, by Penn Global, along with our partners in development and alumni relations, as well as the Penn Wharton China Center. And um, we're very grateful for that. Uh, partnership. It really has two objectives, the first of, of which is to highlight uh, the research that uh, Penn faculty is doing in and on China, uh, even in this uh, time of physical distancing, uh, as well as to maintain and build uh, connections with uh, our uh, partners in China, our uh, friends, our alumni, uh, and our students uh, in China as well. Uh, many of the speakers, including those that you'll hear from uh, today are supported by the Penn China Research and Engagement Fund, uh, which is a university uh, financial support uh, fund that helps, uh, helps to fund research, teaching, and other activities uh, related to China. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can find more uh, information about uh, the recipients of that fund, uh, as well as the other um, uh, speakers in our series uh, at the website uh, that I dropped in the chat. A brief administrative note before we get started, uh, we will be recording today's event for the benefit of those who couldn't join us uh, at this particular time. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, via the chat function. Uh, our moderator will uh, monitor the chat uh, and then uh, pose questions to our panelists. Uh, please note uh, that you can uh, submit questions uh, privately uh, via a private message directly to our moderator, Emily Hannum. Uh, just make sure that the message is set to uh, private. Uh, and that will allow you to uh, send uh, a question uh, or make a comment directly to the moderator without it being visible uh, to the wider uh, group. Uh, I'd also uh, now like to turn uh, to uh, an introduction to our moderator, Emily Hannum. Uh, professor Hannum is Professor of Sociology as well as the Associate Dean for Social Science in the School of Arts and Sciences at Penn. She holds a secondary appointment in the Graduate School of Education and directed a 15-year longitudinal study uh, of childhood poverty and upward mobility in China. She's also been a consultant on educational development issues to the World Bank, the Asian Development Institute, uh, and UNESCO, among other uh, bodies. And at Penn, she's also a member of the graduate groups in demography and international studies and is affiliated with the Center for the Study of Contemporary China, as well as the Center for East Asian Studies. Uh, Professor Hannum, over to you. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today. Um, uh, I began visiting mainland China for research in my graduate school days in the 1990s, and I've subsequently worked with my students on many research projects with faculty and student collaborators in China on issues of uh, child welfare, education, and poverty, and inequality. Having this long-standing interest in China, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome you today to this panel, which will share details about an ongoing project at Penn on the critical topic of the future of U.S.-China relations. This project will, um, as you will hear, convene a group of next-generation China scholars with the ultimate goal of developing and promoting specific actionable policy recommendations for key stakeholders in U.S. policy toward China. As a faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China and in my current role as Associate Dean for the Social Sciences, I've been really thrilled to see this project developing. I appreciate the vision of the Center as a convening space for international exchange of ideas on this urgent topic, but what I would think is really important and set this project apart is the concerted effort to produce and publicize work that will be a direct resource for the policy community. The urgency of issues facing U.S.-China relations at the present time makes this project all the more important. Here to speak to you about this project are three uh, really wonderful panelists, and I'll take just a moment to introduce them before starting in with the main event. Our first speaker today will be Avery Goldstein. Avery is the David M. Knott Professor of Global Politics and International Relations in the Political Science Department at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China and is also associate director of the Christopher Brown Center for International Politics at Penn and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. His research focuses on international relations, security studies, and Chinese politics and has appeared in numerous uh, journal articles as well as in book form. He's the author of three books published with Stanford University Press, 
Rising to the Challenge, China's Grand Strategy and in International Security, published in 2005. Deterrence and Security in the 21st Century, China, Britain, France, and the Enduring Legacy of the Nuclear Revolution, published in 2000. And From Bandwagon to Balance of Power Politics, Structural Constraints and Politics in China, 1949 to 1978, published in 1991. Avery is going to speak to you today about the purpose and motivation for this project with attention to some hot spots in US-China relations. Our next speaker, um, in line will be Avery Gold, uh, will be Jock DeLille. Jock is the Stephen Cozen Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania and is Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. He's also Professor of Political Science and former Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at Penn and Director of the Asia Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. His research and teaching focus on contemporary Chinese law and politics and um, include topics such as legal reform and its relationship to economic reform, international status of Taiwan and cross-state relations, China's engagement with the international order, legal and political issues in Hong Kong under Chinese rule, and U.S.-China relations. His work has appeared in numerous uh, venues, including international relations journals, edited volumes of interdisciplinary scholarship, Asian studies journals, and law reviews. He has served frequently as an expert witness on issues of PRC law and government policies, and he has been a consultant, lecturer, and advisor to legal reform, development, and education programs, primarily in China. Doc will share with us an overview of the project itself and how it's structured. Our final speaker today will be Nason Mabubi. Nason is a research scholar at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at, at Penn, as well as a lecturer in law at Penn Law School. His primary academic interests are in the areas of administrative law, comparative law, and Chinese law, and his current writing focuses on the development of modern Chinese administrative law. He's advised both the Asia Foundation and the Administrative Conference of the United States on Chinese administrative procedure reform, and he moderates the Comparative Administrative Law Listserv hosted by Yale Law School. He's taught at Princeton, the University of Connecticut, and Yale. Previously, he also served as a trial attorney at the, university, at the uh, U.S. Department of Justice. Um, Nason is also a commentator for Chinese legal developments on CGTN America, where you may have seen him. He's also the host of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China's popular podcast, which I hope you'll have a look at. Nason will give us a taste of the kind of work that will be featured on the project, including some of his own work and possibly a bit of the work of others. So let me thank the speakers in advance for their remarks and thank the audience for attending today. And um, let me remind you finally that uh, we'll be collecting questions via the chat for the Q&A session. So please feel free to post your questions as they come to you and we'll collect them to ask the speakers after they've made their remarks. Um, I'll now turn things over to Avery. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, Scott, and thanks to the PWCC for hosting today's event. Uh, it falls to me to talk about the motivations for this project. Um, and really, I think the, at, at its core, the motivation for the project is the recognition that US-China relations have entered a new era, a more troubled era, uh, and that the uh, reaction in the United States uh, in the political debate and among policymakers is one that could, could do with a little bit more serious thought, um, especially fresh thinking by younger scholars. I'll, I'll let Jacques talk more about the project itself. What I'm going to do is talk about what I see as uh, the outlines and the reasons for this new era in U.S.-China relations and why it's become more troubled. When I say a new era in U.S.-China relations, uh, to put it all too bluntly, I think uh, the argument here is that uh, the relationship that was characterized as one of engagement for most of the 1990s and the 2000s um, is pretty much by the boards. Uh, you could say engagement is now dead. Uh, what is the new era like? And I think we can see the way in which the new era emerged by thinking about the way it began to emerge gradually um, as the United States redirected its attention to the Asia Pacific region uh, after spending the first decade of the 21st century focused on its struggles in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and when the United States redirected its attention back to the Asia Pacific uh, after a decade or so of uh, looking elsewhere, China had become much stronger economically and militarily and was more actively asserting its interests in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, American concern about this role that China was beginning to play led the Obama administration in the early teens to roll out its so-called strategic uh, rebalance or pivot, if you prefer that term, uh, in 2011. 
and it led both the United States and China to more openly see each other as rivals rather than partners as under engagement. Uh, both countries still were trying to uh, maneuver for their own advantage, but were clearly still interested in avoiding direct confrontations. Uh, more troubling in this new era has been the turn it's taken since 2017, and especially in 2019, in which this rivalry is intensified and there are now signs that it's moving in the direction of open antagonism in which the United States and China see each other not just as rivals, but as adversaries. So what's been driving uh, this trend, a uh, trend of deterioration in US-China relations? Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of time here, and I'll just mention four of what I see, what are really many reasons for uh, these trends. Uh, two reflect the nature of international politics, and two reflect uh, the domestic circumstances in the United States and China, the politics within their countries uh, that are reshaping relations. The two factors in terms of international politics I would emphasize, the first one is uncertainty, which reflects this, what scholars call the anarchic nature of the international system, simply the idea that uh, because there's no global government, there's always uncertainty about other countries' intentions, about their future choices they might make, and it encourages all states to worry about uh, how others might challenge their vital interests uh, if they have the capability to do so. I think this in large part helps explain the increasing concerns in both the United States and China about the other side's military and economic capabilities. Uh, and it's these kinds of concerns that are really behind what people have referred to as this process of decoupling, which has uh, begun. We don't know how far it's going to go, uh, but it certainly has begun. And uh, some of the pro uh, panels or uh, papers that are being written in this project that Jacques and Nason will describe reflect the concerns uh, about the nature of the decoupling that's underway. Uh, why the decoupling? Why the concern, uh, the uncertainty about intentions and capabilities of the other side? Well. As I said, it's the under underlying condition of anarchy in international politics, but there are rather specific concerns for each of the countries. The United States is worried that China uh, benefits in various ways because of its ties to the United States, uh, the benefits it derives from investment and trade with the United States and academic exchanges, and the U.S. worries about how this might play to China's advantage in the future, perhaps challenging or uh, jeopardizing American interests. China, for its part, worries about its vulnerability because it uh, has faces certain risks that uh, reflect its dependence on the United States for certain critical technologies that are going to be important, in fact, are already important for China's economic and military modernization. So the first uh, influence is this sense of uncertainty about the future. Uh, the second point to make about the reason for this, this change in US-China relations uh, has to do with the capabilities of the two countries. Uh, it's not just that the United States and China are great powers that could uh, pose threats to one another, it's that these are two countries that are really uh, by the second decade of the 21st century have been set apart from all other great powers on the world stage by their massive capabilities. If you look at the aggregate capabilities of China and the US, they clearly stand apart. There's a big gap between the US is number one, China and number two, and then all the rest, three and beyond. Uh, and as a result of this, there is a natural tendency for each of these two great powers to focus very closely on their main rival, one another, and to compete rather vigorously. There's a tendency to engage in zero-sum thinking, to worry that a gain for one side or uh, for the other side is a loss uh, to oneself, for oneself on the international stage. And we can see this manifest, and again, I'm touching on these things very lightly, in how quickly the US-China rivalry has spread across various sectors uh, and also around the world in the contestation over China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, US concerns about China's role in the Arctic, Africa, Latin America, the U.S. is alarmed about these things, perhaps overly alarmed, uh, and in response, China criticizes the American sense of alarm as uh, unjustifiable. Uh, in terms of internal conditions in the U.S. and China that are shape, reshaping the U.S.-China uh, bilateral ties, a uh, part of this is domestic politics, and in the United States, the important change has been that the, what had been the base of support of the constituency for engagement with China has largely evaporated. Uh, and instead, what's set in over the past decade or so is a disillusionment with engagement on the American side. Uh, engagement is now often said to have failed to serve American interests. I think that's a wrong conclusion or a wrong observation. It's not backed up by the facts. But certainly that belief has begun to prevail in the United States in recent years. Uh, and this belief has spread, and it's not just the executive branch and Congress, it's now begun to permeate I think uh, the view of the American public, at least 
if you look at recent uh, polling that's been done. And so in the United States, we have a bipartisan shift to support for tougher policies towards China, to deal with China as a rival rather than a partner, uh, as had been the case under engagement. And this shift in uh, American domestic political views about China and the relationship with China means that in the competitive political context of the American system, where we have elections and uh, we have two parties uh, vying for office with each other, there's a tendency to try to, uh, in election cycles, to try to demonstrate that uh, you as a candidate and your party will be tougher on China, that they position themselves as being uh, tougher than their rivals on China. Uh, and once in office, uh, incumbents are going to be constrained not to appear soft on China, which may mean that unlike the era of engagement where candidates often ran on standing up to China, standing up for American interests, and then would revert to moderation once in office, that, that pattern may no longer prevail. Of course, domestic politics in China is reshaping the relationship as well. And here, I think the key driver has been the Communist Party's concern about maintaining popular support, which requires that it deliver on uh, its promises to the Chinese public, not only to improve the quality of their daily lives, but also to stand up for China's interests on the world stage. And especially in the, uh, in the recent period, the growing emphasis in China on themes of national strength and China's pride as great power have reinforced, have reinforced this concern uh, in Chinese politics. And it's also fed a perception that the new American hostility shows perhaps that the United States was never sincere in the rhetoric it indulged in during the engagement period when, it's, when the US would say it welcomed a strong and prosperous China as it rose and welcomed the larger role that China would play in international affairs. And so in Chinese politics, there's this sense that the US perhaps is trying to hold China down or check China's rise. The other uh, aspect of domestic politics, which I won't get into in great depth because I'm running short on time here, uh, but certainly would be happy to take questions on, is that this harsher edge in bilateral ties uh, that's being shaped by domestic politics on each side has revived the, uh, revived the set of issues that had more or less been put on the back burner uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years, relatively recent years. Uh, and that those are issues of ideology and values, areas where there uh, are still deep disagreements between the United States and China. And the United States more often now has uh, begun to uh, advance its concerns about China's authoritarian polit political system uh, and the kinds of threats that an authoritarian China poses to the international order that the United States has forged and led since World War II. On the Chinese side, these ideological and value issues are reflected in uh, the sense that the American uh, attacks on Chinese authoritarianism are really part of a renewed American agenda for peaceful evolution or regime change in China that uh, is designed to preclude China playing uh, its rightful role on the world stage as long as it's led uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. And certainly in the Trump administration, the recent tendency to refer to uh, the Chinese Communist Party rather than China as a state uh, reinforces this perception on the Chinese side. So let me conclude, uh, because in fact I'm uh, at my limit here, uh, with kind of a characterization of where this looks to me as though it's headed uh, in the near future at least, and perhaps for the long haul. Uh, my conclusion here is uh, that uh, there is three, ask three conclusions to draw, and they can be characterized as good, bad, and ugly, which uh, uh, may or may not be disconcerting. The good, and I think this is important, is that the fact that US-China relations are increasingly troubled uh, does not mean that they're destined for war. Uh, those of you familiar with the, our book about the Thucydides trap by Graham Allison, the US and China are probably not destined for war. And in fact, because they perceive each other clearly as rivals, they both more readily recognize the dire con consequences of moving from even deep hostility to warfare, because of course they both not only have huge military uh, capabilities, but have nuclear weapons. So there's very strong incentives for these two superpowers to recognize that their interests will best be served by learning to live together, even if as adversaries, despite their antagonism, learning to coexist. That's the good. It's a limited good story. The bad is that given the forces reshaping US-China relations, it's very hard to be optimistic about any chance for a reversal of recent trends, a return to viewing each other as partners, as was true under engagement. And instead, going forward, it's more likely uh, that the two countries will continue to view each other as either rivals or adversaries.
That's the bad news. The ugly news is that the consequences of the sharper U.S.-China rivalry, even if it stops short of being entrenched uh, into this pattern of adversarial antagonism, is uh, first of all, the cooperation, even on matters of common interest, is going to be very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, the implications for addressing issues like climate change, and as we've seen recently, uh, the challenges of a pandemic uh, are something that is very troubling. It's disheartening, really. Uh, and that the sharpening U.S.-China rivalry will also likely result in a slowing of technological progress by undermining international collaboration as concerns about interdependence uh, take root and decoupling proceeds. Uh, it's likely that the sharpening rivalry will result in a reduced uh, the reduction in uh, economic prosperity around the world as it hampers international trade and investment. Uh, and lastly, that it's likely to pose increasing threats to international peace and security, even if the risk of all-out war uh, is not great. So that's not a pretty picture. It's a pretty ugly picture. Um, and it's a, a disappointing picture from those of us who began to go, began visiting China in a, in a um, more optimistic period. But that's not the period we live in any longer. Uh, and how to deal with this not so pretty picture and perhaps minimize the uh, downside risks is something that this project is designed to address. So I'll turn it over to Jacques Delisle, who will give you the broad overview of the project itself. Well, thank you, Avery, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, what Avery didn't tell you is he just uh, gave you a little commercial for uh, the forthcoming Delisle and Goldstein edited volume, which is uh, based on our most recent uh, Center for the Study of Contemporary China conference called After Engagement, which gets into a lot of those issues. So that's the commercial for what we've already done. Now I'm going to do the commercial for what we're undertaking now and give you a brief overview of this project. Uh, as was alluded to earlier, basically the idea here is to bring together a significant number, about 20 mostly younger uh, scholars, that includes academics with a policy orientation or think tank based people with some academic depth to them, uh, to bring to the problems that Avery was just discussing the kind of in-depth specialization in subfields that's characteristic of the younger generation. Uh, and for people who have not reached in their careers thus far, positions in the government where they are now wedded to the old debates about reviving engagement or overthrowing engagement for something like a new Cold War. Just to get a bit uh, beyond that, so we have this, uh, 20 younger scholars and some senior mentors who have held uh, those kinds of positions, offering advice and feedback. And as was also mentioned earlier, the goal here is to develop some prescriptions for U.S. policy. So I'm going to give a brief overview of some of those, but this is very much about U.S. policies toward China rather than the overall <laughs> relationship. And again, we have support for this project uh, from the China Research and Engagement Fund at Penn and also from the Luce Foundation and a few others. Well, it's going to be hard to summarize, not just because I have only 10 minutes at most, uh, but also because this is a joint work of 20 independent voices. Uh, and they are people who bring particular expertise in subfields of Chinese politics, policy, economics, and uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, there is no house view in this project, no attempt at a unified view. We selected people for quality uh, rather than a viewpoint. Uh, and these are all works in progress. We had a plenary session with everyone in the project back in June. Uh, the revised and final versions uh, will be, uh, the, the policy papers will be coming out shortly. Those will be appearing on our center website. Uh, in September and in other venues as well. Uh, but let me just try and say a few things uh, that will give you a quick overview of the six areas in which this project focuses. And I think there are some themes that have already emerged, uh, partly responding to the themes that Avery raised, but th that, are, that run through uh, the individual papers we have here. First, in terms of security policy, uh, one of the themes is uh, don't make China a more formidable giant and a more intractable opponent uh, than uh, is uh, warranted by the facts. A concern that the uh, U.S. Um, has developed a view of China as a coherent hostile power, that that's a very big part of the policy discourse, and it's not terribly helpful. That's not to say there aren't legitimate conflicts of interest in the security sphere. Clearly there are. We could list a lot of them, South China Sea, Hong Kong, um, a variety of others, as well as, as great power competition. But, many of our contributors would say, uh, don't treat it as a zero-sum game. I uh, don't think that the way to go about this uh, is uh, to, to uh, take sort of a scattershot um, hostility on every security-related policy area, that there are instead gains that both sides can make through a relatively sober and expert engagement uh, that disaggregates the security relationship into particular concrete issues 
some seemingly small but ultimately potentially deadly important ones uh, can be managed and there's areas for uh, fruitful engagement such as military military uh, contacts uh, dealing with the risk of nuclear escalation should a conflict erupt and so on a similar pattern i would say uh, in the papers we have on the economic side of things where there has been a tendency to uh, make China a formidable uh, giant and, an, uh, and uh, a country that is pursuing a coherent strategy adverse to US interests. So this is the view of the Belt and Road Initiative as essentially a mercantilist geoeconomic strategy. It's a view that policies like Made in China 2025 are a conquer the world economic strategy. And it's not to say there's nothing behind any of that, but again, it's an exaggerated uh, picture of prowess and hostility that overlooks some of the incoherence and the pluralism within the state-owned enterprise sector in China, the state-owned enterprises and other enterprises within things that get put under the umbrella of the BRI and things like that, as well as overlooking the fact that for all of the frictions we've seen recently, uh, China still benefits from and depends on engagement in an international economic order uh, that has been in place for quite some time. Again, here the theme is not that there are not legitimate conflicts of interest and different agendas. Uh, there are things that, that, that uh, in the view of our writers, uh, the US has good grounds to complain about in terms of China's behavior, uh, whether it be intellectual property rights, uh, industrial policy, trade practices, or the flaws of a WTO system, which doesn't do a very good job of policing the kinds of issues uh, that the US has in its economic relationship with China. That said, however, much of the policy, again, has been uh, too much machete and too little scalpel. Uh, that is, arguments for economic decoupling, which is hugely costly and probably not achievable. Uh, the attempt to essentially perhaps divide the world into two uh, rather different economic spheres, one centering on the US and one centering on China. Instead, here again, the prescriptions are to get a little more fine-grained. Uh, and a little more disaggregated uh, in the approach to these uh, questions. There are issues uh, where there is room for negotiation, cooperation, uh, and indeed a compromise. Uh, there are ways the U.S. could approach its legitimate concerns through attempting to reform international laws and institutions, through adopting its own foreign economic relations laws, whether it be CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. to uh, police inbound investment, whether it be IPR protection, uh, any number of things on that front as well as a prescription that the US needs to do something China did a century or two ago, which is to say self-strengthening, uh, create the foundations for a stronger and more competitive economy at home. Moving to another uh, sector we're focusing on, which is science and technology. In a way, it's much the same story. There is a tendency in the US today and in some US policymaking to overplay a coherent uh, and dangerous China threat. The notion that all technology is dual use, that every scientist or student, at least in the STEM field, who comes to the US as a spy, uh, you all know the rhetoric. Uh, and the US policy, again, overstates both China's technological capacity to date and the pace at which it is moving uh, toward overtaking the US and toward uh, a policy that is, is frankly and fully rivalrous with the US. Here again, there are legitimate concerns. There is technology that has national security implications and national economic security implications. Uh, there certainly are concerns about intellectual property rights protections, and there are concerns about China exporting surveillance technology to some rather repressive regimes around the world, and in which the U.S. believes there's a human rights issue as well. That said, um, some of the approaches, again, seem to be uh, too much the meat axe. Uh, death penalties for Huawei or ZTE in terms of access to U.S. technology, uh, uh, crimping Huawei's expansion through the, the attempt to persuade the world uh, that the solution is banning rather than some kind of mitigation, and in the extreme pursuit of very costly and probably technically infeasible in some ways, uh, decoupling of the tech sectors. So again, the prescription is for a more tailored set of responses, strengthening specific US laws and regulations to deal with the areas of technology that the US has a legitimate and on balance strong interest in protecting. This is the so-called small yard high fence uh, strategy for protecting a uh, technology. Again, uh, export controls, um, uh, supply chain management, uh, risk management, and uh, policies of that sort. And again, some self-strengthening at home, building up the US research and development sector, and perhaps working with other countries to develop some standards on the export and use of surveillance technology, which can be employed in repressive ways by repressive regimes. Just to touch briefly on a couple of the other uh, sectors which have a slightly different structure to them, uh, we have a cluster of, of papers that address 
essentially social contacts, particularly in the educational and research sectors, Confucius Institutes, scholarly exchanges, things of that ilk. Once again, there is a bit of a picture here uh, of China engaged in what some in the US have called a whole of society plus whole of government uh, approach to affect how Americans think and talk about China and to affect how Chinese nationals in the US uh, behave when they are abroad. Um, again, our, our, uh, our participants see legitimate concerns here. There is genuine uh, security sensitive technology uh, that is potentially at risk. There are also threats to academic freedom in the sense of pressure being put on Chinese students and scholars in the US to take uh, positions that are not adverse to official Chinese positions. And there is a concern about chilling free speech among students discussing China-related topics and scholars discussing China-related topics even on US campuses. But once again, there's a sense that the policy approaches so far run a risk of being uh, too much the blunderbuss too much hitting over the head with a club. So we have a Department of Justice initiative that has a very broad and rather ill-informed uh, approach to uh, risks from Chinese scholars and Chinese funding. Uh, we have those who call for no acceptance of Chinese funding of research uh, by American-based scholars. There are calls for shutting down uh, Confucius Institutes and other such things. And some of these in some cases may be warranted, but again, our participants prescribe something a bit more subtle and differentiated, sorting out the real threats from the fake ones, undertaking some judicious mix of disclosure versus prohibition in terms of contacts, and emphasizing protection of American academic values of free inquiry and open exchange, which means welcoming scholars and students uh, from around the world. And then last one I'll touch upon since I've hit my time limit here is energy and environment. Actually, too quick, the energy environment where the tone here is rather different. Uh, here, there's a sense that the US and China have a profound interest in collaborating, but they can't quite seem to collaborate. Partly it's a matter of burden sharing, partly it's a matter of uh, domestic politics. And here, our authors prescribe uh, a rather modest, granular approach. Find specific things one can work on, like re reducing or eliminating alliance, reliance on coal, look for subnational cooperation, uh, try to structure areas of mutual self-interest where we can make modest progress. The modest progress lesson is also, I think, something that drives our final category, which is a cluster of human rights, democracy, and law-related issues. Uh, and here, I think there is a genuine conflict of interests and priorities uh, between the two governments, although perhaps not so clearly uh, between some of what the U.S. agenda has been and some citizens in China. Uh, but here, the critique is that the U.S. has often been delusional and overambitious, the idea that it can profoundly change China with policies. Uh, by uh, inputting ideas and, and, and organizational infrastructure, or by sanctioning one's way into changing China's behavior. And instead, the call here is for modest, realistic approaches, which find small areas of cooperation, incremental support for civil society organizations, and exposing where necessary uh, what U.S. groups and the U.S. government, as well as civil society groups, see as uh, significant human rights abuses. So I run over my time here. Let me pass it to Nason to give you somewhat less of a uh, speed tour through the project and a little more depth on some of the components. Uh, thank you, Jacques, and uh, thank you all for participating in, in this morning or for you this evening session. Um, you know, hearkening back to uh, Avery's initial comments, this is a particularly fraught time in the United States in terms of the discourse about China. Uh, I think I certainly agree that the support for uh, engagement has uh, deeply uh, been uh, minimized in recent years, and maybe even has evaporated entirely. Um, in many ways, the discourse in Washington is, is very toxic uh, about China. And one of the main goals of this project is to engage with that discourse by amplifying the voices of a new set of uh, thinkers, uh, many of whom are academics and are uh, looking at very specialized problems from the context of their research uh, and have maybe new ideas, uh, very concrete, moderate, reasonable proposals based on that academic research, which we're hoping can be productive uh, in, the, in the way that this discussion about China proceeds. I think we all understand that uh, in some ways, there's no going back to what the past discourse about China was, uh, which is fine because the world changes and the U.S. and China are evolving dynamic powers. Um, but hopefully these types of proposals that we're cultivating through this project can uh, 
bring a measure of concrete reality to a discussion that in many ways uh, right now in the U.S. is untethered uh, to reality. Um, whether or not this project will be able to change the discourse in the uh, immediate uh, period ahead of us is probably beyond our control and depends on a lot of different factors. But one way that I think we understand that policy is affected in, in the U.S. certainly, maybe in other countries in China as well, is it by seeding policy ideas now uh, over time in the course of the different dynamics of policymaking, they can become uh, more uh, robust in actual decision making. Um, I think maybe what I can do with my time is talk a little bit about the, the paper that I'm working on uh, for the project to give you a flavor for uh, the style of the argumentation that we're encouraging for all the papers and the types of proposals that can come out of it. Uh, my area is Chinese law. And uh, one thing that I've been very interested in uh, over the years is the way in which uh, the Chinese legal reform dynamic has been a productive area for US-China exchange in relatively technical and non-political terms. Uh, so throughout the reform and opening period, the development of the Chinese legal system has greatly benefited from ongoing dialogues, cooperation, training uh, with U.S. counterparts. And uh, there have been different phases of this work uh, in the 1980s and the early days of the reform and opening period when uh, the Chinese legal system was really in a system building mode. Uh, you had uh, Chinese scholars traveling to the United States under various sorts of programs to study at elite U.S. law schools to learn about the development of American law in different areas of law and go back and use that knowledge to draft laws in the civil sphere and the criminal sphere and the administrative sphere, and to also design uh, legal institutions like the judiciary uh, that had fallen into abeyance during the uh, Cultural Revolution before the reform, reform and opening period. In the 1990s, those efforts uh, took on uh, new uh, dimensions. You had uh, particular attention to judicial reform, uh, both within the Chinese context as a target for U.S.-China cooperation. Uh, you had judicial training programs throughout China that U.S. Uh, foundations and scholars were able to uh, work on. Uh, you had training of Chinese lawyers, uh, both within China and uh, in the United States with U.S. counterparts. And again, all of this work uh, was relatively technical, was not uh, imbued with any sort of larger political overtones. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the late 90s, in 1997, when Jiang Zemin and Bill Clinton held their summit in Beijing, uh, the importance of these kinds of exchanges were memorialized by the, uh, by the uh, US-China rule of law initiative uh, that uh, was, was signed by uh, Presidents Clinton and, and Jiang. Um, going forward to the 2000s, there continued to be a lot of work in this area. Uh, because of the initiative signed between Presidents Clinton and Jiang, you had a new influx of money uh, from the U.S. side that went to supporting uh, the ongoing development of different types of Chinese legal actors. And over time, over the course of the 2000s, there became a particular focus on uh, support for NGOs and capacity building among activist lawyers. Of course, that work became more sensitive as the 2000s went on and into the next decade. And the question that I'm trying to grapple with in, in my contribution to this project is, is there still an area in which uh, U.S. and Chinese legal counterparts can be in dialogue, can be in cooperation, can have exchanges that are useful going forward, that continue to take advantage of the relatively non-political nature of law and legal reform uh, dialogues uh, in order to actually get something done? Um, and what I've been very interested in, in uh, thinking about this is the issues that confront regulators in both countries. Um, even uh, going back to about five, six, seven years ago, well before the current moment, uh, it became clear that there were certain types of regulatory challenges that were being confronted by the U.S. and China in very similar ways. One example would be something like Uber in, in the U.S. or Didi in China. These types of new economy uh, 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 issues that are raised by uh, ride sharing, the challenges that are uh, posed to uh, city infrastructure, to city uh, public services, to taxis and things like that, those are issues that were being confronted by the U.S. and China in similar ways. And so to have U.S. and Chinese 
regulators or scholars of regulation talk to each other about the problems that they were facing in their respective jurisdictions that were actually quite similar but was already becoming a productive area of exchange. Um, also in the area of food and drug, you were seeing uh, in the early uh, period of the Obama administration and going through the Obama administration, increasing dialogue between Chinese regulators and U.S. regulators. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration actually opened field offices in China, which is, is a remarkable thing. Um, in the area of climate, which during the course of the Obama administration, uh, you saw a greater degree of attention on both sides, on both the Chinese side and the U.S. side, there started to be some potentialities for uh, U.S. and China regulators to work together. In fact, one of the papers in our, in our collection uh, from Alex Wong of UCLA Law School uh, looks at whether uh, if both countries want to commit to a carbon neutral future in the future uh, to eliminate coal from their uh, respective uh, economies, how they could work together to achieve that goal. And my uh, paper is meant to say that all of these are uh, productive areas of uh, cooperation, of dialogue that we can continue to encourage going forward and are not necessarily the kind of uh, legal exchange or legal cooperation that we saw earlier in the period in the 1980s and the 1990s, but that's okay because the situation has evolved. Uh, China has uh, changed its legal system in many ways, does not need exactly the same kinds of things from the US as it did before, but this is still an area in which the US and China uh, have some work that they can do together. And of course, the problem before us now that is uh, most clearly crying for this sort of uh, approach is that of uh, health. Uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen all sorts of ways in which if there had been better coordination between U.S. and Chinese regulators, uh, there may well have been a more effective response from the beginning, and going forward, there could be more effective responses. The Chinese uh, Center for Disease Control uh, is actually modeled on the U.S. Center for Disease Control. Uh, there's lots of ways in which the Chinese approach the pandemics has been, especially since the 2003 SARS crisis, has been uh, drawing on a US model. Um, and one of the unfortunate things about the emergence of this pandemic is that in the early days, the US uh, CDC uh, investigators were not able to go to China, uh, despite the fact that they were very willing to do that to help work with their Chinese counterparts to see if they could figure out what was going on with this virus and how uh, the pandemic could be address in, in those early in those early phases. Um, it may be something that even though there will be some problems in the relationship uh, that prevented that kind of cooperation in the early period of January, February of this year, maybe if this becomes a, an area in which uh, U.S. policymakers are made to understand that this could be a productive area of dialogue, they could focus some of their attention on making this a more robust uh, goal of theirs in their relationship with China. Um, certainly, we're about to see uh, issues around vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, we know that you know, the Chinese have said they're, they're getting ahead on vaccines. Uh, the US is working on the same. This is an area that's ripe for coordination and cooperation between US and Chinese regulators. And that's a perspective that hopefully, in the first instance, as our audience is U.S. policymakers at the, at the moment, that U.S. policymakers can be made to see is, is important, uh, is something that should be part of the agenda, the policy agenda going forward. And then in the following phase of the project, uh, maybe a year from now, when we start to try to engage with Chinese counterparts, it could be something that we could address to Chinese counterparts as well uh, in, in, the course of, in the course of the project lifespan. Uh, so that's just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what kind of ideas uh, w one person in the project, meaning myself, is, is cultivating through this the audiences that we're, we're anticipating uh, for this work and what the ultimate goals are for how we hope that these ideas can affect the discourse, uh, certainly in the U.S. and then maybe in the future in China about this important relationship. Um, thanks very much, Nason. Um, I'm now happy to start the uh, Q&A session and I've uh, received a few questions um, already. So I think I'll start off with those. Um, I'll go with these in the order that I received them. And the first question, I think uh, maybe um, ask Avery to speak first about this and then others can weigh in, is a question about um, 
intention versus capability in U.S.-China relations. So the question is, does intention matter for long-term U.S.-China relations given that intentions can change quickly and be disguised? And here I understand that capability means capability to do harm. Yes, uh, it's, that, that's a great question. It's, it's a persistent question in the study of international relations, and it's generally true that, for example, in, in, in intelligence community uh, assessments, they recognize that capabilities change more slowly than intentions can change. Nevertheless, you always have to decide, uh, you have to make some assessment of another country's intentions. Uh, and what you likely are going to do is try to hedge your bets. You're, you're likely to try to say, well, we, we think this is what their intention, what we think their intentions are, uh, but we also have to prepare for the possibility that either uh, we're wrong about their intentions today or the possibility that in the future their intentions will change uh, either because they're, they feel challenged, in, uh, either country feels challenged in ways it wasn't in the past, uh, or because, as often happens, as capabilities grow, sometimes intentions change. It certainly was true for the United States as it became a more capable country and a great power on the world stage. Its interests and intentions uh, in its engagement in international politics broadly uh, also evolved. It became uh, either more interested or felt more compelled to be more active on the world stage. And I think we see some of that with China as well. And so the anticipation there is, even if China you know, likes to talk about not wanting to be a, a global superpower and uh, makes comments of that sort, uh, that you know, it's not necessarily a reflection of evil intentions or insincerity on the part of the leadership, but as a country's capabilities grow, as China becomes more, uh, even more involved economically around the world, it's likely they're gonna uh, recognize that they have interests that they uh, believe they need to protect. Uh, and that protecting those interests may in some ways affect the interests of other countries who will either push back or um, want to respond in ways that uh, China finds objectionable. So the question of intentions is kind of amorphous and hard to get a handle on, but it's always got to be part of uh, your assessment of uh, what kind of policy makes sense for the other side. One final point is intentions are also affected by how other parties act. So whatever China's intentions may or may not be today or tomorrow, uh, they will in part be shaped by the choices the United States makes, which is part of the motivation for this project is let's not make, let's not make U.S.-China relations a self-fulfilling prophecy of a race to the bottom. Maybe there are ways that uh, each side can adopt stances that reflect a desire to shape the intentions of the other so they're not quite as hostile. I can just add to that. I agree with everything Avery said. Uh, you know, the subtext of the, of the question is were, I think, some uh, friction some degree of discord in U.S.-China relations likely to increase as China rose in power relative to the U.S.? You know, very likely so. Some of these things are structurally driven. Uh, dealing with China is just a harder challenge for the United States as it becomes a more peer or near peer uh, power and as it understandably has its own interests and preferences which it will want to push. Uh, but as Avery just said, much of the motivation of this project is to uh, worry uh, about and to try to uh, make modest contributions to averting needless uh, conflicts. And I think on the U.S. side, uh, there was a tendency, particularly in the domestic political discussion of China, to oversell the idea that China would become uh, very cooperative with a U.S.-led agenda, would become more U.S.-like at home. This was a sort of uh, overselling of engagement, and, and the risk of that was the pendulum swung way back in the other direction uh, to where uh, there was this sort of almost outraged disappointment that China didn't turn out the way some of these more naive versions of these policies uh, had hoped. Um, and so you have this swing back to uh, the sense that, that China therefore has been um, pursuing this, this, this hostile agenda. And of course, it sells the domestic politics as well. It's easy to, uh, to say that China is at fault for COVID-19 or China is at fault for loss of American jobs. Uh, it's convenient to blame uh, a foreign adversary. So this does create this risk. And of course, in China, you, you can sell the argument that the U.S. is trying to keep China down, and there are elements of that. But there is this risk, as Avery says, of intentions changing, partly because of the way other uh, states craft their policy, China toward the U.S. and the U.S. toward China, and partly for reasons that aren't directly about bilateral relations, but uh, are driven by domestic politics in both places, as Avery mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, Nisan, did you want to say something? Or? Oh, um. the, the only thing I'd add is on, on this question of the domestic politics of it, that's something that I 
I don't have a clear sense of, but there does seem to be some disconnect between the discourse both in Washington and in Beijing about the other country and um, more popular attitudes within those respective countries. And it may be that the popular attitudes will catch up to the elite attitudes. Um, and it may be that they'll, they'll continue to stay somewhat different, but it's at least with the US, which I'm, I'm well aware of, the polling that um, institutions like the Chicago Council on Global Affairs have done have shown that generally speaking, the perceptions of China uh, in the popular discourse in the US are not as um, concerned slash antagonistic as the discourse among elites. Now, certainly there are certain uh, populations in the US that are quite concerned about the loss of jobs to China, um, but the, the sharpness of the discourse in DC does not yet seem to be uh, the case in the popular discourse. And, and Chinese uh, participants in this meeting will have a better sense of what's happening in terms of popular discourse among Chinese about the United States and whether or not there's that same disconnect um, among elites. But in any case, the main point is to say the domestic politics of it is one that I, I find um, hard to figure out on, on both sides. Um, thanks very much. Um, I have a next question, um, which is a bit different. Um, this question is, with the previous decade bringing huge waves of Chinese scholars to the US and Japan and recent executive orders actively suppressing this trend, how do you see academic interactions evolving between the two countries and how are these going to influence Chinese scholars and workers already in the US? Um, and I, um, I'd invite anyone who would like to weigh in, please speak first. Emily, I think you're best <laughs> positioned to weigh in on uh, this broad question of uh, academic exchanges. Um, well, I would say that I think uh, Penn remains a very welcoming place for these academic exchanges. Um, I think the current um, environment um, at, on the U.S. side has certainly brought more challenges to this, and um, part of that has to do with obviously the pandemic um, and universities being um, largely virtual. Um, but I, I would say that the kind of, um, I guess I can speak from my kind of personal experience, I'm still getting lots of applications for uh, visitors and um, in my current role as associate dean, I sort of sign these, I sign off on these applications. So I'm seeing lots of these at the university as well. I do think that on both sides, there's um, more caution about making, uh, about um, making agreements and that sort of thing due to a kind of lack of certainty about, um, about the kind of trend in regulations about, um, about academic collaborations on the research side. I think um, um, I would say that, that that has to do with sort of um, US government policy or concerns now about um, funding um, and affiliations in China that are funded. And um, I think um, some of these arrangements that have previously been looked upon as um, you know, completely non-problematic are now being looked at a little bit differently in a way that's a little unclear and um, makes people nervous. Um, I think on the Chinese side, I would say with my own ac current academic collaborations that there's a similar sort of um, concern on the part of my collaborators about making sure that everything that we are doing is completely sort of consistent with, um, with um, uh, regulations about data collection in China involving international collaborators, and that certainly has uh, made things more challenging than they have been in the recent past. But on the sort of student academic student exchange side of things, I think that Penn remains um, very uh, enthusiastic about welcoming students from China. Um, I know in our graduate programs we have um, people coming in um, in the coming year in the social sciences and. Um, and I, I think that the prospects are, are, you know, good on the university side going forward, but I do think the environment is, is more challenging than it used to be. I don't know if others would like to weigh in about their experiences. Yeah, if I could just uh, weigh in on that. I mean, I, th I think that we have this unfortunate dialogue or debate going on in the United States now, where the government, uh, particularly the sort of national security side of the U.S. government, thinks universities are extremely naive, 
uh, that we don't sort of see the severity of the security threat, that we don't understand the degree to which scholars and students coming to the US are potentially spies or potentially adverse to US interests. Uh, and the view from the university is you guys don't get academic, that is you and the government don't get the importance of academic inquiry, you don't get the importance of this sort of universal uh, community of, of, of scholarship and research. Um, and, and there's a little bit of truth to both sides, uh, but we all in this room, you know, speaking there on the university side of that, and I, I think, you know, we do understand that there are legitimate uh, security risks that need to be managed and so on, but that right now we're not having a very productive uh, dialogue on that. And of course, American universities do have to be mindful of their relationships with the U.S. government, a huge source of funding, uh, and there are, you know, laws we have to obey and all of that. Um, I worry about some of the downstream consequences. I, I think one of the greatest assets U.S. foreign policy has had over many generations now is students coming from outside the United States to study in the United States, scholars as well coming to do research. Uh, I think it's been you know, a great thing for, for research and the advancement of knowledge, but I think it's also been a good thing for, um, for the U.S.'s place in the world and for people's views of the United States. And I worry about squandering that by sending a signal of a much more hostile environment. And I worry about the implications for uh, some of what we've been talking about on this panel. That is, as Chinese scholars and students access to the U.S. is reduced, and as American scholars access to China uh, is reduced uh, by moves on both sides, uh, we run the risk of a more uninformed dialogue, a kind of dialogue of the deaf. Uh, and that, that strikes me as, as magnifying some of the risks we've been talking about here. Pat, if I could just briefly toss in uh, one point on, on the American side. Um, it's kind of building on what Jacques just said, which is it's not just a matter of a, a less informed dialogue. It's also a question of uh, who serves in the U.S. government uh, who is familiar enough with China beyond having read about it or heard about it in classrooms in the United States uh, to participate in serious debates. And there is, over the past couple of years, um, a somewhat uh, tacit, uh, I'm not sure how formal it is because, of course, I'm not within the intelligence community, but there has been a uh, tendency in the U.S. government, I've been told by people who are in that community, that uh, folks, young people who have spent time studying in China are now viewed as people that they do not want to recruit. They're seen as problematic and it's a, something they don't want to see on someone's record because the concern is that they've been compromised or been recruited while they spend time in China. Uh, first of all, uh, that's always, you know, it's a possibility. It does happen. Um, but most of the uh, research that's been done on this is that it, exposure by young Americans to life in China as a student does not really uh, fundamentally uh, shape their perspective on China in a positive direction uh, or make them more sympathetic to China in, in, in any particular way. So I think it's a unfa largely unfounded concern and it's really a lazy approach uh, by the United States government. Uh, that, you know, the alternative is to do thorough background checks and pay attention to what people's uh, experience suggests rather than to simply say, well, you spend time in China, therefore we, we don't want to hire you. But, but that seems to be what's happening. If I could just add one additional point, um, you know, Jacques mentioned that there's this disconnect between the national security uh, perspective and the university perspective and, and both sides, uh, you know, tend to think that the other side is missing something. One thing that occurs to me that both China and the United States share is that when national security actors get involved in an issue, they tend not to work in a precise targeted way. They tend to work in a very uh, heavy handed way. You know, it's hitting things with a hammer rather than with a scalpel. And so in both countries, we have this dynamic and it's incumbent upon uh, people who see the need for more precision to try to speak back to them um, in as robust ways as, as they advance their agenda. And one of the uh, papers in, in this project by uh, Maggie Lewis, who's a law professor at Seton Hall, uh, looks especially at the Department of Justice's China Initiative, uh, which is at the moment uh, prosecuting an enormous number or investigating an enormous number of cases involving uh, Chinese uh, actors in the U.S. and many of them researchers at different universities. And Maggie's basic uh, point in that paper for us uh, that she's also exploring in other work is that this is too broad, that uh, it's uh, capturing uh, too many different types of things 
uh, even understanding that there may be a core of concern that one wants to focus on, but is capturing too many different things. And one, one very small example that just happened the other day um, is that the University of North Texas uh, just basically kicked out all of the uh, Chinese students and scholars uh, who are studying at that institution who are funded by the Chinese Scholarship Council. Now, anyone uh, in this call who's familiar with uh, the funding for many Chinese visiting scholars in the U.S. will know that the Chinese Scholarship Council is one of the primary ways that visiting scholars in law, political science, anthropology, sociology might come to the U.S. Uh, to study. And there's very little, if any, evidence that the mere fact that it's funded by the Chinese Scholarship Council is some kind of connection to nefarious purposes. And yet, in this current climate, um, given the types of concerns that national security professionals are expressing in such broad ways, University of North Texas just said, you know what, we're just gonna kick them all out with just a few days notice, their email is gone, they're kicked out of the dorms, thank you for visiting. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think our project is, is trying to uh, speak up against is to say, look, even if you do think that there are some legitimate national security concerns, which I think we all do, the approach can be a more targeted approach and not as broad brush as we're seeing. Thanks very much. Um, we, we are at the um, scheduled end time, but I understand that we do have the leeway for those who are able to stay to um, take a few more questions. And I do have some more questions that have been submitted. And so I, um, I'd like to um, go ahead and take the opportunity to, to pose them. Um, let me switch gears and um, ask a, a different kind of question that's come up now, which is, um, I think, uh, first aimed at Jock, and this is, how may the young people of Hong Kong flourish in the current environment, in particular, people that have an international element in their careers? So, I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of the question. Did the Hong Kong, the young people in Hong Kong, how will they flourish in the current circumstances? Yes. Um, Yes, in particular, people that have an international element in their careers. Yeah. So I, I take it that's a reference to the national security law just adapted for Hong Kong and, and some of the things that, uh, that lie behind it. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult time for, for Hong Kong. Um, it's in some ways not entirely new. We've seen this kind of uh, phenomenon cycle back and grow uh, over 20 or 30 years now. But certainly the national security law is uh, exceptional in how broadly it defines actions or statements that are prohibited. Uh, so there are a large number of Hong Kongers who are outside of the Hong Kong SAR and outside of mainland China at the moment who are worried about going back. Uh, and some of them have, uh, have watched what has happened with the roundup of, of Jimmy Lai, the, the newspaper publisher of many uh, Democratic activists and, and candidates uh, have watched that with great trepidation. Uh, and there is a great deal of concern about the law's extraterritorial reach, uh, the purporting to punish these actions even when committed outside of Hong Kong, outside of China entirely. Um, that's a real huge chilling effect. And I think you're going to see uh, some exodus. I mean, I've already seen a uh, quite disconcerting uptick in academic acquaintances in Hong Kong who are looking for moving elsewhere. Um, so there's a lot at risk, and I think we are seeing the most severe test yet of something that people have been worried about since the 1980s when the arrangement for Hong Kong's reversion to China was crafted, which is will uh, the promise of autonomy uh, and continuity with the prior system be honored sufficiently that people in Hong Kong feel uh, that they will have reason to remain there and the opportunity to remain there and be productive. Um, obviously, the question is different for different Hong Kongers. Um, in, in many ways, uh, much of what goes on in Hong Kong now could, could be done and is done in other Chinese cities. Uh, but I think for people who are highly international in orientation or who are in um, fields where their work could not be done, um, effectively on the mainland, whether that's uh, academic research or whether it's a, a certain type of democratic leaning politics, I think you know this. This may be the time that that, that breaks. Um, I've occasionally likened Hong Kong politics to malaria. Uh, it's a fever that recurs every few years. We've seen many, many examples, but this looks like a severe one, and 
Um, a lot of us hope it won't be fatal, but this is, I think, the most severe test we've seen since 1997, I would say, even all the way back to 1984. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, I think I'd like to um, uh, share a kind of compilation of the last uh, set of questions. So this is a few different questions that are on broadly related themes, and I'll um, state them all and then ask the, um, the speakers to weigh in as they'd like, and then um, we may need to conclude this session. Um, these questions, uh, one question has to do with how the two powers um, can deal with ideological differences, um, which are in the background of every subject, and um, a concern is raised in this question about um, what happens if the, an authoritarian label is put onto one side before a dialogue can start. A second question is about whether economic decoupling is really possible or is really impossible between the U.S. and China. And this uh, questioner raises some examples of steps both on the U.S. side and on the China side to uh, try to implement some decoupling. And then a final um, question is, how will the U.S. engage in cross-strait relations in the future? So I'll um, ask the speakers to briefly weigh in on these, and then I think we will conclude. Okay, I, I will try to <clears throat> be a model of uh, succinctness here. Uh, so those are three big issues. Um, on the decoupling one first, because that pops in my head first, um, I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, we know it's costly, the decoupling, and that leads people to believe that it really can't take place. But what we've seen is it's gone farther already than I think most people had anticipated when people first started talking about it. Uh, and what we don't yet know and we don't yet see is where it's going to stop. Um, some in the business community and economists will say, in fact, it's impractical to imagine complete decoupling. Maybe that's the case. But uh, sometimes governments have ways of doing foolish things. So I'm referring to both countries' governments. They may, in fact, do foolish things that are costly. Uh, in terms of ideological differences and whether that's a barrier to um, uh, dialogue, I don't think it's a barrier to dialogue, but I think it's a, a challenge for the two countries to figure out how to bracket their ideological differences. That's what they need to do. Uh, the reality is China is an authoritarian one-party state, and the United States, at least for now, is a liberal democracy. And um, that means that the people living in these countries, certainly the political leaders, have different values and different uh, commitments ideologically. Uh, but that, that doesn't preclude learning how to manage those differences in ways that make it possible to at least avoid conflict and perhaps even cooperate on certain issues. The United States and even the United States and the Soviet Union managed to find ways to uh, uh, cooperate on issues when they could and bracket their ideological differences when it really mattered to them. Uh, and then the third bundle of questions was, I'm forgetting it, oh, Taiwan cross-strait relations. Yes, this is uh, an issue that has now become uh, deeply worrisome, I think probably both in China but also in the United States. And they've seen recent trends in the current administration to want to um, more publicly um, strengthen uh, the U.S. commitment to be worried about peace in the Taiwan Strait. The United States does not have a treaty commitment to come to Taiwan's defense. It is a statement in U.S. law, the Taiwan Relations Act, which articulates the American interest in peace and stability in the Western Pacific and the welfare of the people living on Taiwan, that everybody assumes mean, uh, sets, sends the message to China that if China does certain things and we're trying to resolve cross-strait relations and reunify uh, Taiwan politically with the mainland, that they should anticipate an American response and that that was sufficient to send the message to China not to uh, rock the boat too much. There are now people in the uh, U.S. government, not, not just in the administration, uh, who believe that that commitment needs to be made more explicit. And so we've seen certain steps being taken that I think everybody, are, everybody on this call is familiar with to try to clarify the, the closeness of U.S.-Taiwan ties. Um, and that is turning up the heat in the Taiwan Strait in a way that it hasn't been turned up since the early 21st century. Well, as is the case with most things, I agree with Avery. I'll just supplement it a little bit. Um, I, I agree that ideological differences are not um, an inevitable source of conflict. The trick is to avoid ideational conflict. That is, you can manage ideological differences, but if it is not a relationship where the conflicts are based on, on interests or even values, but where it becomes this sort of uh, uh, mutual demonizing on ideological grounds, I think that, that leads one down the path of, of uh, excessive or at least needless conflict. 
On, on decoupling, you know, I agree it's very costly. Um, it's hard to imagine it happening completely, but as Avery said, it's gone farther than many would have expected. I just point to a couple of, of, of nuances to that. One is that part of what is driving it is that there's been uh, a securitization, a sort of linking to security of economic issues. Uh, COVID-19 has underscored that with the panic about masks and ventilators coming from China. Uh, add that to, to some of the more um, dark views in the US of the Belt and Road Initiative, where it's about using economic leverage to political ends. Uh, there is this, this um, uh, political impetus behind uh, decoupling that I, I think is, has gotten much more bundled with security issues. And as far as corporate behavior, you know, some stuff was going to move out of China simply by logic of comparative cost and wanting to diversify supply chain risks and all that sort of thing. Uh, but as Avery suggests, a lot of companies are acting in the shadow of the uncertainty of what either side's government is going to do to accelerate a decoupling and the sensible business thing is to hedge against that possibility. Uh, finally, on the Taiwan issue, um, I mean, in some sense, there's, there's a real underlying stability here, which is the US position has long effectively been one of dual deterrence to deter leaders in Taiwan from pushing the envelope toward formal independence in a way that would provoke a response from China, and to deter Beijing from taking coercive measures to, uh, to bring Taiwan back into the fold, to reunify Taiwan uh, in a way that is not acceptable uh, to people living there. So that's relatively stable. Um, we're now in a moment where, as always, the U.S. kind of sits in judgment of who's at fault uh, for bad situations cross strait. Uh, there have been times when the U.S. has viewed Taiwan as the source of the problem. Now the view is that, that Beijing has taken a hard line toward a relatively uh, measured uh, and stable government in Taiwan. So that creates this, this sense in China of a more pro-Taiwan um, agenda. Um, that said, I think, as, as Avery points out, there is a uh, view in the current administration uh, that the way to achieve that relatively stable goal of dual deterrence and stability in the strait is to uh, to lean very heavily to the Taiwan side and take a very tough line uh, toward China. Um, that, I think, at times has been counterproductive, um, uh, but it is not, as Davey says, just political appointees in the Trump administration. I think it reflects the more general uh, souring of U.S. attitudes toward relations with China with which we began our discussion today. Uh, and I think it, it, it reflects a change in recent years in the view of where Taiwan fits into U.S.-China relations. That is, there was a time when it was thought that Taiwan was the most likely cause of an unnecessary crisis in U.S.-China relations. Now I think a fair amount of friction is baked in, and there's a sense that even, quote, solving the Taiwan problem, which might include the U.S. yielding more toward Beijing's positions, would not really fix uh, what ails the U.S.-China uh, relationship. Um, you know, one can have a debate about that. What worries me about the current policy is that in addition to those fundamental things, which, which are a legitimate area of potential disagreement debate, is that we have now moved back into a moment where some of the administration's policy is treating Taiwan as an instrument uh, of U.S. relations with China and in a sense, in a sense playing the Taiwan card in a rather different way than the U.S. perhaps in the past. Uh, I'm not sure that's good for bilateral U.S.-China relations, and I'm pretty sure it's not very good for Taiwan. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I understand that I need to conclude our session now. We do have more interesting questions and I will make sure to convey these to the speakers so that they know what are the topics of interest in um, uh, future, for future events. And um, I thank the speakers for a really exciting set of comments and thanks to the audience for a really um, interesting and engaging set of questions. Um, thanks again and um, have a good evening to those of you in China and a good morning to those in the US. <laughs>
right. See ya.